Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. Today on the bench I have a couple little amplifiers that I built a while ago. This one here. If you watch my channel for a while, about six years ago, I think it was April 2014, I put up a video of me building this one. Didn't say much about designing and building this. I kind of just talked about the chip I used and showed the board halfway assembled and I showed it assembled in the case did a music test and that was it well I used the TDA 2003 chip it's one of those 5 pin TO220 type chips but this chip was made to be used in car stereos it was a fairly rugged chip can drive low impedance loads I say was because it's been discontinued Although you can still find it on the new old stock market. It was a very good chip. Kind of sad to see it go. But this video I want to actually uh, run some performance tests on these amplifiers. Well, one of them anyway. They're you know both the same chip. And see how they perform. Okay, so story on this amplifier is I built this six years ago. I made it to use in my pickup truck. I had a little Ford Ranger. It only had an AM and FM radio. So I hooked up some rear speakers and I connected this amp to it. That way I could take my little music player and play my music. Because, you know, radio is not that good anymore. And uh, if I went on a longer trip, I wanted to be able to take some music with me. Well, it's no longer in my truck because I don't have it anymore. One day the truck was parked out in front of my house and some kid on his cell phone ran straight into it, pushed it up into my side yard. And because it's about 15 years old, it wasn't worth a lot and, uh, you know, it's too much to fix, so uh, it was totaled out. Although I did get the uh, Kelly Blue Book value, it even gave me a little more, which is surprising, but... Not really enough to buy another vehicle. I don't want to buy another vehicle at this time. Well, the next amplifier is this one here. Same chip, TDA2003. This one, it's a little dusty. It's been sitting around. I haven't used it in a long time. I built this probably 25 years ago, back in the 90s. I used it for my TV set. So I can have stereo sound on the television set back then when I rented movies on VHS. It's all made with Radio Shack components. You have the project case, volume control knobs, and balance, the switches. I think it's all from Radio Shack. This amp has one unique feature here. The rear speakers has a switch for them connect them here there is no ground connection on the rear speaker so when you hook them up it actually is bridging them across the two channels and when mono signals are played it cancels them out so it gives like a rear channel surround sound type effect matter of fact that's how surround sound encodes their uh, rear channel signals by putting them out of phase so when an out of phase signal comes from to these rear channel leads you actually hear that in the rear speakers and though uh, Dolby surround is a little more advanced than that there's some signal steering and stuff going on that's primarily how the sound is encoded and it works really well there were some movies with very good surround encoding and it sounded like action was happening all around you so what I'll do now is uh, pop these amps open, take a look inside. And I'll probably use this one to test since it has these connectors that are much easier to use. Okay, have the screws removed. And look at that. Kind of a mess. Wires running everywhere. Shielded cables. I actually etched this board. Yeah, not the cleanest layout. The uh, 
the holes aren't even but it got the job done a little heat sink there that's probably adequate but you know for these chips it's not bridged or anything so the the power is not too high though I would probably use a larger heat sink now as I say no heat sink is too large hang on a second I want to see if I can get a date code well I couldn't see any recognizable date code on the chips but these capacitors have a 9305 date code so yeah that would make sense Notice one thing I did here, I soldered a ground onto the cases of these potentiometers, which I highly recommend doing. I think uh, I did that because when I touched these, probably before I had caps for the uh, controls, you'd get a buzz. So grounding the casing of the controls will eliminate that. Well, here's the newer one. It's a little more compact design. I think it looks neater. I think I did better on the layout. I have the, the film supply bypass capacitor real close to the chip. I use 220, I'm sorry, 2200 microfarad output coupling caps. Even have a fuse in there. And there's the low pass filter caps on the input part of the low pass filter I always talk about I recommend that any amplifier should have those did I ground the casing of the potentiometer I don't see it up oh, yep right there copper soldered to the casing going to the ground so yeah, I uh, think I did much better on this one, design-wise. I even made the case myself. I made it out of acrylic. If anybody's interested in me uh, talking about how to do that, I don't know if there'd be enough interest, but yeah, I might make a video if enough people are interested in making your own acrylic case for your projects. Okay, well, that's that. Let me put this back together and hook up the other amplifier for testing. Oh, before I do the test, I should always play the little music sample. I always forget to do that. There's the LED, speakers connected, source, and power. And that's not a good setup there. It'll short out. Power supply is current limited anyway, but... Sitting idle on channel 2 there at 12 volts is drawing 100 milliamps. Some of that will be into the LED, but most of it's to the idle current of the two chips. So it's not super thrifty on power, but it's not too bad. It's about what I expect. Okay, music test. Play the usual selection, Bongo Madness from the YouTube library. Okay, it sounds good to my ears. Uh, let me put my ear up to the tweeter. Very tiny amount of hiss, nothing to worry about there. Now let me hook up the rear channel and uh, see if you can tell the difference.
Now you can hear some of the ambient sounds of some of the instruments because they were center panned with that stereo ambience effect added to them. So that's why they sound like that. Okay, so I have the non-inductive 4 ohm loads connected. I'll test the amplifier at 8, 4, and 2 ohm loads because the chip is designed to handle even less than 2 ohms, but I can combine my load resistors here for those combinations. So I'll get you pointed at the scope, and we'll continue on with the test. There's clipping. Notice the slightly downward angle of the clipping. That's because this capac this uh, amplifier has output coupling capacitors. It's not bridged or anything, of course. But you know, I'm not seeing any weird oscillations or anything going into clipping, so that's good. So now I just tune out the clipping and get a voltage measurement. Uh, 3.43 volts RMS, so 3.43 squared divided by 4 is 2.9. So we're getting 2.9 watts at 12 volts, pretty much exactly what I would expect. So what I'll do is take a bunch of more measurements at different power supply voltage and with the different load resistances as I mentioned before. Well, it's the next day. I was just about to load all my video clips into the video editor when I discovered that I forgot to shoot the distortion part of the video. So, well, at least I have it still set up here on the bench. I can continue on with it. Don't get used to the 60 frames per second. I accidentally left my camcorder in 60 frames mode. And I know that's... Uh, big editing load on my computer but anyway let's uh, get this set up here pointed at the older scope here on the bench the Rigel and just ignore those blips that's just electrical noise it's probably 60 Hertz noise that'll go away when I turn my video player or my uh, audio player on which I just did Okay, this is the distortion at 20 hertz. And it's really just background noise. Let me make sure I'm in peak detect mode. So it looks pretty good. Maybe a couple blips, very small blips. Okay, we're now at 1 kilohertz. And of course, that's the one I have my 1% pilot signal in. And uh, it looks really clean. No distortion there. So now we'll take it up to 10 kilohertz. And uh, I have to adjust the scope for that. That should be enough waveforms. And again, it's looking pretty clean. So the TDA2003 looks to be a pretty clean chip. For the frequency response test, I'll use the FeelTech arbitrary waveform generator. And I'll just use the sine wave. Get this pointed at the scope. And we're at 20 hertz. Now the waveform should be touching the very top and bottom. However, because it does have an output coupling capacitor, I believe I used a thousand micro Henry or uh, micro Henrys, micro farads. At 20 hertz, it's going to roll off. Depending on the input coupling capacitor and the output coupling capacitor, you know you could make it go all the way, but it require pretty large values. So go ahead and increase the uh, frequency we're at 30 40 you yeah, know we're, we're getting there 50 we're at 70 there's a hundred and I'll just uh, increase through the frequency band here 
you see it pretty much going to come up and it'll be flat all the way out to 20 kilohertz I'm sure There's 20 kilohertz, and I can go a little beyond that. There's 30, and it's starting to roll off, probably because of the input filter I have set up there. But, you know, I'm not sure why I even bother with the frequency response test with solid state amplifiers, because they're always going to be flat. They're always going to roll off at lower frequencies at some point, depending on the capacitors in use. On a hi-fi amp, it would roll off at well below 20 hertz. But again, in this case, it just happens to be the fact that there's a output coupling capacitor, which is going to provide the dominant effect of your low frequency roll off. I was going to perform a step response test, but See how rounded that is? That input filter is pretty aggressive. Saw how it was attacking this, the signal starting at 30 kilohertz, the, I should say, the uh, frequency response. But yeah, that's so rounded. When I put any uh, capacitor across the output, it doesn't do anything. Even a one microfarad did, has no effect. Yeah, maybe the slightest, but yeah, I'd have to unsolder the filter capacitor and able to run this step response test. So yeah, it's not going to worry about that here. Okay, here's the results of the power test. I'm not going to go through all these values, but at 2 ohms, at 15 volts, I was able to get 7 watts per channel. And I measured the current on the supply at that level. It was hitting 2 amps. And because at lower voltages and lower load resistances, the current draw would be less. So I just measured it at its maximum here, 15 volts, 2 ohm loads. And here's the rest of the values if you want to pause and read those. So there you have it, a couple TDA2003 amplifiers makes a neat little fairly low power amplifier something you can run on battery power and as always sounds pretty nice so that will do it for this one hope you enjoyed and catch you on the next one thanks for watching hey snick huh what we'll turn around here there he is. He's got something to say. What the hell was all that about? Plug this thing in. You're fired. You can't fire me. I don't work for you. Okay.